Hi, everyone. This is going to be uh, part of our uh, series on the Nicene Conference, but this is also for those of us who want to help Paulinus realize that uh, your guy hasn't always been uh, on the right side of history, so to speak. And so if you are correct, his doctrines have been rejected as uh, not only the doctrines of Antichrist, as we'll see, uh, but also as uh, false, heretical, and uh, you yourself actually believe his doctrines are heretical, but his doctrines, who the person who was speaking his doctrines, you know that person's name, and we'll get to that in a minute, but, but you're never told that person was just simply repeating and quoting Paul. You may even know about it. You know, you might have been able to put two and two together, but as long as no one else has ever re recognized that the person's Paul is attached to this person's name and his name is Arius, do you think you can just skate by and no one's going to, you know, realize that you're following a heretic when you believe in Paul's, Paul being inspired? Because according to Trinitarians, if they were logical, if they knew the history of the church, they would realize Paul hold, held the view that was defeated at, <laughs> at Nicaea. Okay. So, yeah. So let's get into that. And that was covered up. And uh, we'll see how severe p people viewed Paul's view uh, in the mouth of Arius. They called it the doctrine of Antichrist. It isn't, but it's still wrong. It's just not the Antichrist. So he's a heretic. And we'll, we'll get into why and what will prove, proves that. The primary thing that was addressed at this council, and they had to assemble this council with, with presbyters, with, with priests and bishops from all over the world. They gathered, and then the number they give is 318, that's debated, but there as many as 1,800, it's estimated, were invited. I mean, you want to talk about a crisis, you know, the number one thing on the docket was what Arius was teaching, and others like him that bought into what he was teaching. What was Arius teaching? What gained him this notoriety? Well, I think we can sum this up in the following statement. Look at what this says. We know one God, alone unbegotten, the Son begotten by the Father is created and was not before he was begotten. Do you understand what Arius is painting here and what he was teaching? He was teaching that Yeshua did not eternally pre-exist. Okay, so we see that Daniel Joseph is saying that Arius' heresy is that Jesus did not eternally preexist, meaning he, he was not immortal, meaning he had a creation point. He was never begotten as son. He was always the son and not begotten by God. So somehow he had this relationship of son to father without actually being begotten as the son. That's his, that, so that's what Arius uh, wasn't accepting. He was, he was saying he was begotten, which is who uses those words? Paul uses those words, right? He says right here, just to repeat again, he was the firstborn of all creation. That's Paul's own words, wor words. And firstborn means first begotten. If you could translate it that way too. Yeshua was created. He is a created being. Arius is coming right on saying Yeshua is not God. Now, one thing you, you want to mentally do in, in, in this is an exercise that typically people, when you're confronted with this, that I didn't put it up here, but I should have. But just mentally, put a chalkboard in your mind and draw a line straight across the middle of it. And the way to look at this is the relationship between God and the created. Above the line is God. He is the creator. Everything else goes below the line is created. Okay, so you have the creator versus the created. What Arius did is he took Yeshua from above the line and he said, no, he belongs down here. He is a created being. Now, one thing that, you, you know, just to be fair and balanced and just looking at history for what it is, I want you to understand Arius did not have a low concept of Yeshua. His concept, his understanding of Yeshua is very, very lofty. I want to be very clear on that. See, because this is where the deception comes in. And I mean diabolical deception. He has a very, very lofty concept. Okay, so now the speaker, Daniel Joseph, is going to talk about Alexander of Alexandria. And who he's talking about is actually called a, quote, pope. 
But I think he didn't use that word because that might be misleading and require a lot of explanation. But we need to know this Alexander is actually the Pope of Alexandria, which is like a comp competing Pope to the Pope of Rome. So they have multiple popes that are super bishops over a region and multiple other bishops, and they call them popes. So this was going on now in the, uh, well, he's the 19th Pope and Patriarch of Alexandria, if you read this uh, Wikipedia article. So I just want you to understand that and that he is going to make a criticism of, uh, of this Areas and uh, we don't have a date of birth or date of death, but that's who he is. And that's one of the greatest opponents that Arius had was a man by the name of Alexander of Alexandria. Simple enough to remember. But here you have a good old apologist, right from Arius's hometown, right from there. And Alexander he rose up to combat what he was preaching. And fortunately for us, we actually have some history recorded, preserved from Alexander, describing what he was up against with Arius and his cohorts. So I want to take you, I'm going to show you a little bit of history here. And this is Alexander's uh, deposition of Arius. And this is what he says. Now there are gone forth in this diocese at this time certain lawless men, enemies of Mashiach, teaching an apostasy, which one may justly suspect and designate as a forerunner of Antichrist. I was desirous to pass such a matter by without notice, in hope that perhaps the evil would spend itself among its supporters and not extend to other places to defile the ears of the simple. In other words, what Alexander's saying is he's looking at Arius and what he's teaching, he's like, that is utterly insane. Nobody in their right mind is going to believe that I will not dignify this craziness with a response. This will come to nothing. I'm not going to worry about it. The problem is, is Alexander saw it metastasize like a cancer. He saw it spread. And so this is the thing. This is amazing. Alexander is just like, nothing is going to come out of this. This is so ludicrous. And you got to understand, prior to this, you know, this, as they would say, the greatest crisis in the history of Christianity, prior to this, no such teaching would ever be conceived and was ever conceived. Okay, so now I think you understand why I'm labeling this, the Paul and this cover-up of Paul's defeat at Nicaea. So this crazy view, this insane view that nobody could believe, and I think what this points out is Paul was so unknown <laughs> apparently, that uh, people could be teaching this doctrine and not know it came from him. So this is a cover-up. I mean, of course, everybody knows who this comes from. and But everybody plays the game because nobody will mention it's from Colossians. <laughs> it's right out of Paul's playbook. Paul's heresy is left completely hushed up and hidden over. And you, the audience sitting there, have no idea that the guy teaching you is, obviously he's deluded. I can't believe he's deliberately lying. But he's reading all these books and they never mentioned Colossians 115, right? They never mentioned Colossians 116. They never mentioned Colossians 117. They never, never mentioned Colossians 118. They just completely assume that you can live in two alternate universes. One where you actually read what Paul says and then you're reading what other people say Paul says and you don't notice it's the same thing that Paul says. It's just fun. It's almost funny that human beings can create these divisions in their brain, but it's called propaganda, creating a narrative. And the narrative has to create boxes in which you can now look at areas and think you don't see anything about Paul when he's exactly teaching what Paul's teaching. And this guy just deliberately says, and I believe in complete sincerity, that nobody ever taught this before. But he has to know Colossians. The guy's an expert on Colossians. He's actually doing a commentary on Hebrews, which is quoting passages that are the same to the same effect as Paul. And we'll see those passages in, in uh, Hebrews in just a second. All right, so we're, I'll stop for a second. Okay, so let's begin. So uh, in our previous series on Nicaea, I pointed out uh, the, the real barrier at Nicaea was John 17, 1 to 3, and it's going to be the first thing put on the table. And the first line of the Nicene Creed is this cre creed, uh, are these verses 1 to 3, but somewhat paraphrased, but still they're all there. And so this is what Jesus actually says uh, in uh, John chapter 17 in his priestly prayer to God on our behalf. 
And he says, uh, it reads this way, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. And that this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So obviously Jesus is de defined who is the only true God. So whatever you read, whatever you think you think you're seeing on the page, if it makes someone other than the Father God, then you know you're misreading it. Or somebody has tortured the, the, the passage so you can't see it. And believe me, if the Trinitarians could have gotten this verse out of the Bible, they would have. But this actually was the first line proposed in Isaiah. So they, it was still too well known. You've got 1,800 people at this conference, and they know this verse. And this is a barrier to all the Trinitarian concepts. And it's how are they going to overcome this verse when their emperor, Constantine, wants them to. He wants them to find he's God the Son because that's what he believes in. God the Son, Saul Invictus, or Apollo. Either one's different names. All right. We've already gone through this. I'm not going to belabor it. What was Jesus invoking when he said that the Father was one, uh, the only God, only true God? Let's be clear about that. And it's uh, John, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God is one, Yahweh. And Jesus then quotes this in Mark 12, 29. He says, this is the first of all the commands. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh. Obviously, he said Yahweh. He didn't say the Lord. Yahweh is our God. The Lord is one, Yahweh. Now, I have a question up here. If true, who is the one and only in the Greek word monogenes, which means one of a kind in John 1.18? We'll get into that a little later. Does John, Jesus ever flatly deny he is the Logos? The Logos is not his own. So we all know in John 1.1, 1, 1, John says the, you know, the, the, in the beginning was God. In the beginning with God is the word and the word was God, right? So now people say, well, we call Jesus the word. Therefore, Jesus is the word. No, that's not how it works with Hebrew. I can give you a name. I can call you the righteousness of Yahweh, Zadik. Are you, the? and, and let's say it's a, a special title of, of God, because God is also righteousness, right? Well, it doesn't mean you are God. <laughs> Same thing, or, or a better example would be uh, uh, Isaiah. So that's Yahweh is salvation, is, uh, and that's the name of Isaiah. He, he's, he has within his name, if, if you said, you met him on the street, you'd be saying, hi, Yahweh is salvation, how are you doing? <laughs> that's how you would greet him. Hi, Yahweh is salvation, how are you doing? And Jesus, Yeshua, that's uh, Yahweh saves. Hey, Yahweh saves, how are you doing? Hi, Yahweh, say, Yahweh saves. So just because someone has the name of Yahweh in their name or uh, whatever the, the, the term is, doesn't make that person Yahweh <laughs> or that he is, he is, you know, it's just, it's just a, a term people like to give their kids. And it sometimes can come true for that person that they act and behave in a certain way. And that's why people would name their kids like that, because using Yahweh is a very serious name, isn't it? Anyway, so just because we call Jesus the, the Logos, he denies he's the Logos, and he denied that he was God in that, what did we show you? The prior passage. He's denying there's anybody who's God other than the Father. So the, the, if, he, if he has the word dwelling in him, it does not make Jesus God. It makes the word in him God, and that's different. God came to dwell in flesh. So let's take a look real quick. I'm going to go into this now here. I didn't do it in the prior episode, so I, this is uh, new. So uh, in, de in the detail we're going to provide. So in John 1, 1, that's where the Logos is God, and verse 114, we have the same word Logos, and it says the Logos was made flesh. So now you have the word inside of flesh. The, what is flesh can be called a person named Jesus. But once the word comes to dwell in him, whenever that happened, and I'm going to show you it happens at his baptism, you'll see, is uh, that person becomes indwelled. And when he becomes indwelled, you can start calling him by the name Logos because he's personifies, more than personifies, he's, he's actually the temple of that word. So now you can call Jesus the word, but he wasn't the word until the word came to dwell in flesh. We just think he's talking about the birth, but no, he's talking about the baptism, and you'll see why. Because the first thing that happens after this is John the Baptist shows up right after this prologue. It's the prologue, and then John the Baptist, who witnesses the dove coming down, God speaking from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, all of those things. That's when the Logos comes on Jesus in the original accounts. And of course, they were deleted by Jerome in 4 or 5 AD, and that makes it harder for you to see it. But you're going to see it today because we're going to quote Hebrews 1, 5 when we get further in here, where the original, this day begotten, is spoken to Jesus at his baptism. 
Jerome forgot to delete it in Hebrews 1 verse 5. So that's a, a benefit to us. We have some way of tracing it back. All right. So uh, the Logos you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. John 14, 24. So the Logos, the word inside of Jesus, and it's singular, is not mine. That verb is, is very important. It's singular because you'll see what I'm going to show you about what uh, the NIV does to this verse. So you cannot see it in a minute. Uh, and then in John 14, 10, it says, a father in me, the father dwells in me. So you see the word, the father are identical because why? The father is God. The word is God. Jesus says the father dwells in me. The father is in me. And he says the father dwells in me. So the father and the word are interchangeable concepts. Okay. And then, in, so I think we already covered it. Oh, yes. So in John 1, 14, it, John says this. The word logos became flesh and dwelt among us, shakan, which is the same word we say when the, the spirit of God came to dwell at the temple, the, the temple, God's spirit, shakan in Hebrew, in the temple, the shakan of glory, you've heard that. So the shakan is that verb, it's a lone verb into Greek. And so that word means the, the heavenly glory of God came to dwell in Jesus. The same glory of the one and only so even the NIV had this correctly. So remember I told you what is the word monogenes mean? So here is monogenes. The NIV had it correctly until 2010. And then they went backwards. This is my recollection. I have to go back and look at my notes. But that's what I remember. And they changed it to one and only son, which is false. We'll see why. We'll show you the Greek in a little bit. Uh, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, John 1.14. So this is, this is the way... Uh, uh, Jesus is talking, and that verse, John 17, 1 to 3, is what starts off the Nicene Conference. So there's a very clear, not, Jesus and John had made it abundantly clear to a Greek speaker who, who that Jesus isn't the Logos, the Logos comes to dwell in him. They can't make that mistake, and they don't have our English mistranslation of John 1, 14. They have close to the meaning we see here on this screen of what the NIV had at one point. The glory of the one and only. So God is the one and only. The word has a glory in and of itself. That's what comes to dwell in Jesus. All right. But I'm going to show you the NIV version of John 14, 24 deliberately, probably, obscures your ability to find the connection to John 1, 14. The NIV, so that's when the logos comes to dwell in Jesus, right? The NIV does so by changing word logos in 14, verse 24 into words. So they just they don't translate it as a singular word like it should be and it's a and so it changes into words plural and then modifies the verb tenses to a plural so really they're disguising it harder making it even more impossible to see it to fit their false plural of the word word okay this way the niv does not let you readily identify the logos of 14 verse 24 and that and there it meant an indwelling word from the father with the Logos in John 1, 14, equally simply uh, talking about an indwelling word of the Father. So you see, there's a reason why you don't, con when, when people tell you the truth of what's going on, it sounds shocking because you've been acculturated not to even see when God is being clear about he, his son is where he's dwelling. His word comes to dwell in flesh. And he, God, is the one we should be giving the glory. There is a glory of the Logos that's being talked about here, right? Go back. The glory of the one and only. There's only one God. And do we give him glory? No, we're always trying to hunt for glory for Jesus. And I am all in favor of having glory for Jesus. But can we just give God some glory occasionally, once in a while, just a little bit, please, pretty please? Because that's what God wants. He wants a little glory. We give him zero. We find every way to give just to Jesus, take it away from God. And that means we're better Christians somehow when we're worse believers in Yahweh than ever before. We were we become more corrupted in our minds by listening to people who teach us to read everything in a Trinitarian way, to take the glory away from God, give it to Jesus, and somehow that makes us better people. It makes us worse people. <laughs> and this is what they were trying to do, make you a worse Christian. So just accept this change. This is what the NAV had before 2010. I don't believe it existed has existed since 2010. I, I'd have to check. <laughs> But I remember doing a whole article on it. I think it was 2010 or maybe it was 2014. They changed it back to the way it used to be, the only begotten son, which it, there is no word son there. And the word begotten was a misunderstanding of the of the word monogenes, genus being uh, they thought was generated. Instead, it means kind, gen like genus, monogenes, genus. Okay. 
Anyway, let's keep, continue. Now we're going to study Arius's view, and Arius is a bishop of Alexandria, Egypt. He taught that Jesus was the first creation of God and not God himself. Where did he get that from? From Paul, okay? According to Arius, Jesus was the first and highest of all created beings. Arius said there was a time when the Son was not. Jesus was then given powers to create. We saw that with Paul. It said after Jesus was uh, created, the, he was first begotten, and then Jesus made everything else. He's the Father of all things, basically. He then created the Holy Spirit as his greatest creative act. Well, that's an interesting thing. Uh, but I, by the way, I've never seen that anywhere, and I've read tons of stuff on Arius. And I've never seen anybody make a claim that Arius said that God created uh, that. God created the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to put that on a I don't think so category, just so you know. And then this is funny. I'm you gotta laugh. It's so sad. There is the last thing he sends it says in the next paragraph, there is no hint in scripture that Jesus was a created being. False, 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 false. How many times can I say false? That's right what Paul says. The first begotten of creation is Jesus. Boom. What, what more can we do? That's Colossians 1.15. But he pretends like he doesn't know. And how can you not know when you're going to hear, you're going to see people say that Eris's argument was based on Colossians 1.15 at Nicaea. And this is the guy telling you about Arius's doctrines at Nicaea. And he doesn't know this. This is really it just I'm, it, I'm ceased to be amazed at the lack of knowledge of people who pretend to know things or they're dishonest. I just want you to see something before we move on here uh, about this particular guy. He quotes the next verse after Jesus is the first begotten of creation. He does quote the next verse. For by him, Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven, invisible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, all things are created by him and for him. So if you've just told us that Jesus never had a, uh, uh, there's no hint that Jesus was a created being. So you're letting us think by reading just Colossians 1.16 out of context, and I've read you in context, it says the first begotten of <laughs> is Jesus, Jesus. And now you're telling us he, there's no hint he was a created being. It's the verse you, just before the verse you're quoting. So ladies and gentlemen, there's something wrong in Denmark when people can do this. They can quote out of context, deny the very verse, deny the meaning of the very verse before the verse that just quoting you he's quoting 116 and the very verse before that says jesus is a created being he's the first begotten son i, I just i sometimes i, I just want to okay uh i'm just going to do one thing i'm going to let you determine what you think of what people like this are like so that's 115 what's the prior verse say just read it who is the image of the invisible god the firstborn of every creature end of story how can you come and tell us the exact opposite? There is no hint in scripture that Jesus was created being. I'm sorry, firstborn of all creation. Duh. <laughs> and, you know, am I not able to read English? Are you unable to read English? Uh, it just frustrates me to no end. That, and these are the people who are telling us we have to believe in a trinity. And they're willing to do this kind of presentation to you. Do, 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 you, do any of you get the concept that these people have no moral ethics about truth? And, and they're, they're shameless about it. <laughs> okay, but let's move on. So uh, then, so by, about the 305 period, some in church were claiming that Jesus was not merely indwelled by the Father, but identical to God. So Bishop Arius in 306 AD rejected this, citing Paul's own words that Jesus was, quote, the first begotten of creation. As William Wachtel summarizes in his article, Colossians 115, preexistence or preeminence, the, Ar quote, Arians, based upon Colossians 1, verse 15, thought he, Jesus, had a beginning and was the first creature whom God made, while the Athanasians thought he had no beginning and was himself co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial with the Father. Okay, so there were uh, people who rejected basically Colossians 1.15, and they believed Jesus was God and consubstantial with God and had been never created. And then you had others saying he was the firstborn of creation. And these are two different views. They're not the only views, but there are two views about Christ. So let's keep reading. Now, uh, I've already discussed with you about uh, that gentleman's statement. And I think I've already discussed that Jesus is not the word in John 1. Okay, so we can go through this if you want. But uh, all things were created by him. So it, it, the, it, the word, all things were created by the word, okay? And the word, Jesus says, is not mine, belongs to the Father, right? So, And Jesus says the only true God is the Father. So only the Father can be the word. The Son can't be the word. 
Okay, so that's a mistake of categories. Okay, so we don't have to worry about this anymore. This is not talking about Jesus being the Word. The Word is the Father. And the, if, if the Word is God, Jesus says the only true God is the Father in John 17, 1 to 3. So that rules out any concept that you can believe that Jesus is the Word. He's called the Word, but is, that doesn't mean he is existentially the Word. Okay. And uh, I want to show you what happens, what they do to John 1.14 in this mess of trying to understand what happened in Isaiah. John 1.14, and the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we gazed on, it, on his or its glory, by the way, just so you know, uh, glory as of the only, now it doesn't say son, it says what? It says, to, to look to the left below that, monogenes. And monogenes doesn't mean what they originally thought, uh, the only begotten. It means the only kind, the only one of its kind, the unique, and then the whatever the, the the vowel or not the vowel, but the son that the word that follows. So, uh, okay. Now notice what happens next. When did he re his glory get revealed? When did he get recognized? Okay, and John testifies about him. So. This is when, if you read it together with the way the Gospels of Matthew and Luke originally read, the Father speaks from heaven, this day begotten thee, the glory of the Father, the Word, came to dwell in Christ at his baptism. So now I hope you can understand why Jerome felt impelled to get rid of, in Matthew and in Luke, this day begotten thee, and all of this happening at the baptism, because you see, now... If you knew those verses were still there and you're reading John 15, and, and, excuse me, yeah, John 1, verse 15, and then John the Baptist is going to testify about Jesus, well, then you would realize the word only came to dwell in Jesus at his baptism. That's when the dove comes down and actually flies into him and the Holy Spirit comes upon him and the God from heaven, Yahweh, speaks and says, this day I begotten thee, which is still in Hebrews 1, 5 and in, in Hebrews 5, 5. So you can't say it's unbiblical. Uh, Jerome forgot to delete it everywhere, but he got he got the two most important places and erased them. But you can go through all the earliest manuscripts, you'll find them all in the Matthew line, the, the Vulgate going all the way back to the hundreds and so, so on. So it's just one of those crimes that Jerome committed. He's going to have to deal with God at Judgment Day for how many people got misled by him doing that because I have to fight for something that I shouldn't have to fight for, to fight for Jesus's being generated as a son did not happen eternally in the past, as Paul claims. It happened at his baptism. He was a special son of God made at his or uh, uh, begotten at his baptism. And that's why these are so closely connected. He dwelt among us. We gazed on his glory, the glory of the one and only uh, from the Father, full of grace. John testified about him. You see how naturally it would have followed? You would see this more easily, that it's just simply the baptism is, is the when this happens. No wonder he doesn't put any emphasis on the birth of Jesus. And also, remember, Mary's living with him. When he when he wrote this, is maybe she'd already passed. But of all people who would have known about a virgin birth, it would have been that lady. And and that's not how he's 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 not he pays absolutely no attention to alleged virgin birth. By 96 AD, that's not in his vocabulary. He's paying attention to when he became the son of God, when that uh, that came to dwell in him, and that happened at the baptism. So when you put the original manuscripts together, this all fits properly. All right, and then uh, I think we talked about it. Arius proposes a starting point when they got to the Council of Nicaea, and he appealed to John 17, 1 to 3. I've done this before in another video, so I'm not going to go over it, but it's Erdman's Handbook of to the history of Christianity, page 157. So they started with John 17, 3. And, um, but the second argument of Arius was Colossians 1, 15. So let's read Colossians 1, 15. That's why I'm doing this video. I want you to see it for yourself. Paul said Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Therefore, he was not, he's a created being. He is not God from eternal he's not immortal okay and so you can see this guy on that stage is screaming and yelling <laughs> okay and and we i want to come back to one more thing how what uh, uh he said and I'm, you know what? i want to double check something okay so now i want to show you uh we're looking at the uh slide that uh 
that gentleman had up on the screen. And Alexander, this is the quote Pope of Alexandria. So the, not the Roman Pope, but the uh, 19th Pope in the lineage of Alexander. And he says that uh, whoever this is, is the, uh, who says this teaching, the teaching of Arius, that Jesus did not have eternal preexistence, is an enemy of Christ. And he's a forerunner of Antichrist. And he is spreading evil and he's hoping it will spend itself and will not go, not extend to other places to defile the ears of the simple. So this, these, these are basically curses on the doctrines of Paul, okay? That he's the Antichrist, lawless, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can't not tell me that uh, uh, Paul's doctrine did not receive opprobrium and condemnation and did not get accepted at Nicaea. Okay, now what, what you have to know is these two views did not require the solution that uh, uh, that came up in the end. There was always the solution of what John the Apostle said, that, that the Word came to dwell in flesh, and the Word is God, and Jesus is not uh, an eternal son. <laughs> And stick with the Bible, which said this day of begotten happened at Jesus' baptism, not somewhere else in a prior time. And this was uh, 325. Jerome had not yet deleted those words out of Matthew and Luke. So they were still there for another 60, 70 years. Okay, so uh, it wasn't until, um, uh, yeah, so 4 or 5 AD was when the New Testament came out by the Vulgate. So there, there's, there were many other alternatives than just Athanasius or Arius's view. But I think it's just very curious that the very view of Paul and Paul is condemned uh, historically before Nicaea, as strongly as you can imagine, by, by this guy, Alexandra, Alexander of Arius. Uh, excuse me, Alexander of Alexandria about Arius. Okay, so I think that makes the point. Okay, so then returning to our slide, uh, so Paul says, uh, as we said in 115, Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Then it says Jesus turned around and created all things, making him the father of humanity, by the way, which is really to me is offensive because that's depriving God, the father of his role of being our father. And Jesus said, our father who are in heaven, that's how we are to pray. So he's the father. And so Paul has it all backwards. This can't be right. We're going to show you why it was wrong. C. Anderson, C. Anderson Scott's article, Christ, Christology in the Dictionary of the Apostolic Church, 1915, says, Scott says Paul's words in Colossians 1.15 mean he himself, Jesus, was part of creation. Okay, and um, so, and then I point out here, where did Paul get these ideas uh, that Jesus was the creator, yet not a mortal God, was from the Septuagint mistranslation of 257 B.C. of Psalm 102, verses 22 to 34. Uh, and let me just tell you what the Septuagint is, that the uh, Alexander the Great and the Greeks conquered Egypt, and uh, they changed their language to Greek, and then eventually Greek became popular for the Jews in Alexandria, that capital, and their leader said, you know what, we're going to get 70 rabbis, send them off into 70 different locations to translate the entire Torah and the Law and Prophets, or at least the Torah, and come back, and, and lo and behold, what a miracle. All 70 of them had identical versions of translations. Well, they were the worst translations on this earth, so who could believe this malarkey? But anyway, uh, we'll go into the malarkey in just a minute, because we're going to see proof positive the Septuagint is a corrupt text, meaning a corrupt translation. So it said in uh, the Psalm 102, which is what misled Paul and also the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, it said in Greek, God says, God is speaking to another God in Psalm 102 saying, thou Lord, so God number one is talking to God number two. So you have to have two gods. And for pagans like the Greeks who commissioned this gospel, excuse me, this translation, it's no, no surprise they would end up having a passage where one God speaks to another God. So, so thou Lord, God, God number one says to the other, thou Lord at the beginning, you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. So as it's going to be understood by Paul and the epistle writer of Hebrews, the word Lord there is Jesus. So God the Father is supposedly speaking to God, Lord, Jesus. At the beginning, you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Remember, Jesus is the creator of everything except himself, according to Paul in Colossians. And that's the same thing in Hebrews, as we'll see. This is all based on a complete mistranslation by the Septuagint. Wait till you see the actual verses. 
In the original Hebrew, however, human, human anointed one says this instead about God. God was the creator. Okay. Uh, and I just want to remind you, the only church that teaches what Paul teaches is still. So Paul's doctrine is still hanging around. It's with the, guess who? The Jehovah Witnesses. They teach that pre-existing Christ is God's first begotten son. They said that the son was the father's only direct creation. So everybody else, even Paulinists, will go into church and violate their, their master Paul's teachings. And they'll say the Nicene Creed, you know, Jesus is the begotten, not made. Okay. So they've given up. Uh, he was not made. He was not created, even though Paul said he was created. He was the firstborn of creation. Therefore, he says of the creation. He's not before the creation. He then turned around and created all things other than himself. So they'll go into church and they'll bow their knee to something that violates Paul's own words. They don't, they, they don't, ca they don't carry Paul as high as you think they do. And that's maybe a good thing. Okay. Okay, so uh, there's scholarship agrees that Arius was advanced in Colossians 1.15. That was his doctrine. Christian scholar Grudem, very reputable, straight line, Protestant uh, evangelical scholar, concurs. He says the support for the Aaron view was found in Colossians 1.15. This is in Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology and Introduction to, Introduction to Biblical Doctrine, Zondervan, 1994, at page 243. If you go to our webpage on this, uh, it's called Paul's Christology. Go to link, the link there. You'll be able to read page 243. Same thing in the next one. Based on this, the Arians held precisely as Paul teaches in Colossians 1, verses 15 to 16, that, quote, Christ is a creature of the Father, though existing before the world, end of quote, which interpretation was revived later by the, quote, Socinians, Unitarians, and Rationalists. So some Unitarians even go for this bizarre idea. Just to show you, yeah, like, what's... People can't just accept what it said in John. The word isn't Jesus. It's the word is God's logos, and the logos came to dwell in flesh. And that became manifest at Jesus' baptism when the, the spirit and the dove came to come down on Jesus. And that's the correct order, reading the prologue with the very next verse. After the prologue is John the Baptist. Okay, it's just a shame that all that got messed up. J.P. Lang, Commentary on Holy Scriptures, 1871, Volume 3 at 447, also an active URL. If you would go there, you click the link, it'll take you right to that book and that page. Now, Colossians 1.15, where did Paul learn this? Compare Barnabas' epistle to the Hebrews. So it's, it's best to get into Paul to understand the verses upon which Paul is reading, but he's not quoting. They are quoted instead in Hebrews. And so Barnabas is a buddy of Paul, and they can share information, and that's how you can figure out what Paul's talking about. In Hebrews 1, verse 2, God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So how did, how did the, he get that, that Jesus made the worlds? Now, didn't make himself, but he made the worlds, which is what Paul says in Colossians 1, 15, right? So then he says, and I love this, it's great, for unto which of the angels said God at any time, you are my son, this day I have begotten thee. So now he's saying in this verse that Jesus is begotten. Now the question is, when did that happen? I believe this writer knows that happened at the baptism. So he's not trying to deny that Jesus was uh, uh, begotten as the son of God at his baptism. Now, this quotes Psalm 2, verse 7. And again, this is key because he's quoting actually the, mess, the most important messianic passage in the entire Bible is 2 Samuel 7, which is what says G Jesus has to be of the lineage of flesh of the house of David. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. So God tells David, your special son, the one who, you know, I'm going to give all the kingdoms, I'll be, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. And so this uh, passage is perfectly mixing up properly that when Jesus is told this day I begotten me as his son at the baptism, God was doing exactly what he promised he would do in 2 Samuel 7. So that's a really beautiful connection. I, do, I, I don't like the epistle to the Hebrews for other things it says, some horrible, terrible things, but this is actually a good passage. And then finally, he says, in, in, not finally, but the next verse, 1, 6 says, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Now, this is even trickier because this implies the angels have already been created and then Jesus brings the firstborn in. So when does that really happen? So really, the epistle writer of the Hebrews thinks Jesus is what? 
born at the baptism. So that's his concept. So the angels already exist. And when is Jesus the first born of, uh, in, in, the, in the sense of the most important born son, meaning there's plenty of sons of God when you consider the angels beforehand. But Jesus is somehow a special son of God that complies with Psalm 2, verse 7, the anointed or Meshach, and 2 Samuel 7, the special son of David. That's what I think Hebrews uh, author chapter 1, verse 6 is saying. So that's really a great uh, uh, a nugget we're getting out of the epistle to Hebrews that he even understood. It was after the baptism of Jesus and after angels already existed. That's when Jesus got, was begotten. You see, it's right here in the epistle to the Hebrews. So if you think Hebrews is authoritative, this this passage, uh, to me, uh, this verse and the verse before it are the ones I would pick pick one five and one six. They perfectly match up with what I'm trying to say about this day begotten. He happened at the baptism, and he has the same concept uh, chronologically. Okay, so now we're going to, again, we're looking at uh, Hebrews because this is where what's under the basis, the basis of Paul's doctrine in Colossians 1, 15 and 16 comes from the very same things that are being cited in Hebrews 1, uh, 9 through 10, uh, actually from uh, 8 through 10. So looking at verse 8, it says, but about the son, he says, your throne of God will last forever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Does it actually say that in the Hebrew Bible? No. The Masoretic text from 800 to 900 was confirmed as accurate, and hence the errors of the Septuagint by virtue of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls covered Psalm 45, 6 to 7. Again, there is God, but no son. So it says about the God, about God, he says, your throne of God will last forever. So there is no son there in the original Dead Sea Scrolls and in the original Masoretic text. That's a mistake and fundamental because God was being called son in ver, uh, uh, Hebrews 1 verse 8. And you could read all the old books about proving that Jesus was God. The Trinitarian arguments always said when you look at Hebrews 1 verse 8, this is the one verse, and it was the only verse for a long time until they've corrupted more texts, is this was the only verse you could say where Jesus was called God, and guess what? It was based on a mistranslation of a Septuagint. It violates the Dead Sea Scrolls version of this passage, and it, and it uh, violates Dead Sea Scrolls, and it violates the Masoretic text, which is the Jewish heritage of you know how they keep track of their text. So... Yeah, it never said son. It never said about the son that God addressed him, your throne, O God. It said the, about the about God, uh, the, the, the penitent applied to God and said, your throne, O God, will last forever. So that's what really happened. And, uh, and this is because uh, uh, verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 1 is a quote from the Septuagint of Psalm 44, verse 7. Uh, and that's where we can see the error, where it uses the word son and has the uh, son being talked about as God. And uh, this is confirmed uh, yeah, there in a book by Edward Tesh, Psalms, College Press 2004, it refers to the son as God. And that's refer also confirmed uh, was exactly how the Septuagint misread. So this is obviously where the writer of Hebrews got his view that it read about the son, his, it, uh, he was addressed and it said, your throne, O God. So the God label was used for the son. And we can see now it was based on a complete Greek mistranslation in 257 BC. The Septuagint was being relied upon. The Septuagint is a false, misleading, uninspired work that Christians have been told we are supposed to accept because Paul quotes it 47 times for 47 new different principles of <laughs> that are at variance with the original text. That's what they mean. Is there 47 times he quotes the Septuagint when it's at odds with the Hebrew scripture? And so we go with the 47 different times he cites it in, inconsistent with the Hebrew scriptures. And we believe, and your, your scholars will tell you, Paul is allowed to correct the Hebrew Bible. Well, this is this is one of these alleged corrections that this time it's Barnabas is doing it, but Paul's saying the same thing if you put two and two together. So let's keep going here. So uh, I think we've okay. So what do we have? We have if we go to the uh, okay, we already did that one. Okay, next again the Masoretic Hebrew was confirmed as accurate. Uh, yes, all right, we already did that one. Okay, the last part here is and thou Lord in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. So this comes from uh, another uh, uh, translation, and that would be of Psalm 102, 
I just want to make sure I've got this right here. Yes, and this is being addressed to God. The whole the whole passage is being addressed to God. So the way that the he, Hebrews writer wanted you to think is that verse 10 is part of a passage addressing the Son. So he actually says that. Ver, look back at verse 8. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God. Then he verse, quotes verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness. He's still talking to the Son about the Son. And verse 10 is supposedly still about the Son, and thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundations of the earth. And that's how you get this idea that Paul and Barnabas and Hebrews both say that Jesus is the creator of the heavens and earth after God created him. Okay, so that's false because the, the verses upon which it's based are not talking about the Son. That was a mistranslation in verse 8. Okay, from the source text, which is uh, the Psalm 44, then verses 9 and 10 are taken from Psalm 102, and they don't have the subject b being about the Son, and you can't take Psalm 102 and read even if you made the mistake of relying upon uh, Psalm uh, 44, which does have the, in, in the uh, Septuagint mistranslation, does have Son in verse 8 of uh, Hebrews 1, uh, 1, 8 there. But we now know that's false. But how could you in your good conscience mix verses 9 and 10 as being about the son also? Because that's what you make it sound like. So you're making it sound like the son was told in verses 9 and 10 that uh, you know, God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. And God in the beginning, you, Lord, meaning you, the son, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundations of the earth. How can you in good conscience mix verses 9 and 10 from Psalm 102 with Psalm 44, which, which you know, if you, we can, we see is a mistranslation of the original text. And, but Psalm, but Psalm 102 has nothing to do about the sun. So, so this was a really fairly obvious mistranslation. Okay. I'm going to say it outright because it doesn't matter anymore now. I mean, he's dead. Barnabas is lying here in verses nine and 10. He knows those verses are not about the sun. They don't mention the sun. <laughs> Verse 8, he's got an argument. The Septuagint had the mistranslation, and he took advantage of it. But how do you, in good conscience, mix verses 9 and 10 with verse 8 when those 9 and 10 come from Psalm 102 that don't mention a son? And you can see that. Okay, so this is the this is how the psalm should read, and it's there at the bottom. That's a Desi Scroll version of the psalm. So what's he doing? What's he? He's playing games with his readers. He's a liar. <laughs> okay, I could call him a liar. And, but that's what Christians, our, 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 our leaders should have told us. You know what? We have some false stuff in our Bible. And, and uh, the leader of the band is the epistle to the Hebrews. It is a, a, an, I, have an ep, I have a series called The Epistle from Hell because it is. It's from the pits of hell. This is one of the most evil, despicable epistles I've ever, uh, you can ever imagine. It actually says, God, Yahweh, must remain dead as the testator, or we cannot have a New Testament. Read those verses where it says you cannot have a New Testament as long as the testator who gave you the law still lives. He must die. He must die. And this was the doctrine of Marcion, that God, Yahweh, is dead in the land of Sheol. So you have to understand that death, in a Hebrew sense, could be you're just living in Sheol. And that's where Marcion said God, Yahweh, lives and will live with all his people. But the good God... The God of Jesus, according to Marcion, this is another heretic, he teaches us there's a good God and a good Jesus, and we're going to live with them forever in a place called heaven. But God, Yahweh, is the bad God, the demiurge, and we're going to, the bad people all live with him in hell. And that's what they mean when they say, <laughs> when they say he, he dies. He doesn't really die, die. He, he, there's always an existence for Yahweh, but that's how they denigrated him. Anyway, the point is that this is whoever whoever could in good conscience mix these things up like this is just is it's an epistle from hell and it teaches us ter terrible things that you can't can't have a testator you can't have a testament without a testator dying and then you can get the benefits and basically the benefits are we live without the law because now the testator who gave the law is dead okay i'll leave it there there's a lot more to say about that but anyway okay so uh, we will see the modern erasure, erasure of the variances in Psalm 102. So we don't have any uh, question marks about that. Uh, all right, so I'm going to wrap up. Basically, what we've shown is you can help a Paulinist who's trapped in Trinitarianism 
that uh, he that's another problem. I mean, uh, you've got uh, if you if you agree with me about Trinitarianism, you've got to help your friend out of both Paulinism and Trinitarianism. And uh, Paulinism is uh, I mean, I don't know which is worse. I mean, one is to believe in apostate and the other is to believe in something that makes you an idolater. So, I mean, I mean it would pick pick which one you want to deal with first. Um, I, I don't know if there's any priority there. Uh, I think they're equally uh, problematic for for a believer in God, a, believe, a lover of Yahweh, a lover of Christ, n- neither of which God wants us to be uh, involved in idolatry or in apostasy. So, uh, I mean, there's just uh, only two ways to go with that, uh, and that's you know forward or backwards. So, but you can use Colossians one fifteen to show them. Look, the Trinity rejected Paul's views, therefore the Trinity. It cannot be true if you believe in Paul. So that's number one. And that might get them thinking, well, okay, uh, now they could either say, oh, well, I reject Paul. I, I no longer had this great honor of him because I didn't realize he was anti-Trinitarian or destroyed the Trinity doctrine. Okay, well, at least they're consistent. And consistency is the first way to de- help people is they have to be self-consistent. You can't believe in contradictory concepts. So hopefully that would help. And then when they get to the Trinity doctrine, you have to say, okay, well, now you just have to realize there's been a lot of manipulation of verses. This uh, video you see can see here, if you just go through it, you know, there was changes uh, or not changes, but mistranslations of monogenes in uh, uh, John 1 verse 18. There's a lot of deliberately ignoring uh, John 17, one to three, where Jesus defines the only true God is the father which therefore, when you go back and look at John 1.1, 1, 1, you know that monogenic, excuse me, the word is God, means that the Father is the word, and not Jesus is the word, not the Son is the word, not, none of that. You, it has to be the Father because there's only one God. If you strictly go by what John 17.1-3 says, that Jesus says the Father is the only true God, and then everything else falls in line with that if you then read carefully and and you get rid of that monogenes, meaning uh, the only begotten son is the monogenes, and th- then you would think that Jesus is God. But if you realize monogenes did not mean the word son, which is translated right into the text improperly. Let me see if I have that. Yeah, do you see this? This is where deliberately the word son is put in here, but it, the, the, uh, the word is simply monogenes, the only monogenes. So it means only one of its kind. So there is no word son, which would be H-U-I-O-S or I-O-U-S if you transliterate it into English from Greek. There is no word son there. That's a misrepresentation. It says monogenes. Now they had a one time they thought monogenes was one who had been generated. You can even hear the word generated in, in that. But if you can also think of genus like a on a slide, well, that's what would be the other. It'd be one of a kind, a unique one of a kind thing. And so God is what? A monogenes, one of a unique thing. So the, when the uh, monogenes came to dwell in flesh, it didn't mean one who had been generated. It would mean one who had been um, one of a kind. And that went, meant God, the Father, or his word in, in Jesus came to dwell in him. Uh, all right. So I hope that uh, helps. You, you can help somebody who's stuck in uh, Trinitarianism to realize there's been a manipulation of words, mistranslations. There's also been false verses added. Uh, you know, the, the baptism formula, b- b- baptism in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we showed that was false. That did not exist in any manuscripts that predated 325, <laughs> okay? And it was quoted 17 times by Eusebius in, in his cr- history of the Christian Church alone, as without having any reference to it being in the name uh, of other than Jesus. And it was quoted eight times in the book of Acts that people got baptized into the name of Jesus eight times in that book of Acts. So you've got all of this pre-325 clarity on that and so on. So you just have to kind of make them realize, you know what, a lot of what we believe is because we've been manipulated to believe it. But if you actually sit back and think about it, it's not true. So you can help them, help them realize that Paul was rejected and therefore he, they didn't treat him as an inspired voice. In fact, they just threw him over the, over, over the board. And that's, what I'm, that's actually my ultimate point for everybody. Paul did not have that much authority at the time. The only reason he's being elevated at this time is his words against the Sabbath were loved by Constantine. When he realized that, he did like that part of 
Paul, and he used that vigorously. And he uh, uh, he called he started using Judaizing as a as a, a words of opprobrium. It's a opprobrium, and that's how Paul gained traction. But otherwise, he was a nobody. I mean, literally, nobody took Paul seriously enough to uh, try to win this argument at Nicaea. I mean, they they cited him, but you know, the overwhelming vote even though it was under extortion and coercion, uh, was still, you know, five votes for, for uh, Arius's view that agreed with Paul's and 100 and, or 200 votes against Paul, if you think about it. And Athanasius had no verse. I mean, that's really the, the sick thing about this. There is no verse that clearly says Jesus is God. <laughs> you have to construct it from all these, you know, uh, 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 very vague statements that are in scripture that you then say, oh, well, maybe he's divinity, deity, whatever. When really Jesus, if he says before Abraham, I am, what, what did he say? He says, when I'm speaking on my own, you'll know the difference between if, if it's me speaking or the father. And that's in John 7, who's speaking when it says before Abraham, I am. Well, it's obviously God the father because he uses the words I am. And, and that's the other thing is if, if Jesus were the son, he can't use the words I am that I am. That belongs to the father. That's a self-existent, pre-existent, eternally existent, immortal being says that. That's self-existence. Jesus does not have self-existence. He's the begotten son, according to even Paul and uh, even Jesus himself. I mean, he doesn't claim he's existed from eternity. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but that's what you end up getting. If you don't follow Jesus' rule, he said, you'll know, John 7, 20, I think it's 21 to 23. You'll know when it's, those who uh, follow me will know when I'm speaking or when the Father's speaking through me. So you got to be able to tell the difference. And if you make a mix up, you're going to think God's talking instead of Jesus is talking about something, you know, that's not related to conveying God's word directly to you. He's, he's talking about something interpersonal with you. You know, let's go get some fish or something like that. All right, everyone. I hope this helps and uh, God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.